Hi there trailer owners. Today in your 2022 Trails West by RPM, we're gonna be taking the old electric drum brakes off and converting it over to electric over hydraulic disc brakes. And to complete that installation, we're gonna be using Hydrostar's 1600 PSI actuator. And this is what our actuator looks like when it's installed. The entire thing will fit inside of your front compartment and that's the most common places where you're gonna install it when putting an electric over hydraulic setup on your trailer. And that's what this is specifically designed for. It's a 1600 PSI actuator that's designed for disc brake systems. In a disc brake system, you need higher pressure than you would with a drum brake system. Hydrostar does make drum brake actuators as well. If you had a, a hydraulic, electric over hydraulic drum setup, you could use that, but those are only rated for our 1200 PSI. We need that extra pressure to get the proper clamping force on our calipers with our brake pads. It's, they operate a little bit different in how they work, your disc brakes versus your drum brakes. So we need that higher pressure, but we get a lot more surface area between the brake pads and rotors than you do on a shoe and a drum. So we're gonna get a lot more stopping power with this. And we, that extra stopping, our extra clamping force from this higher pressure is gonna ensure that we get that. There's an internal, proportion, uh, internal pressure proportioning valve inside of here that will help ensure that all the brakes are being applied evenly. And that just gives you a smoother operation than your traditional electric brakes. With the electric brakes, once power gets sent down the wire to the brakes, it activates the magnet and then they just instantly activate. It's a bit jarring and they're going to activate it whatever um, the setting you have on your brake controller is. Uh, now, a lot of brake controllers do have uh, proportional brake controllers where they use an inertia sensor that helps to ramp up that voltage to make it not so jarring. Um, but you have, that's, that technology is inside the brake controller. The brake controller still will work fine with these electric over hydraulic ones. There are brake controllers that are specifically designed for these and those are the most recommended ones to use. Um, Takancha's Prodigy P3 is a great brake controller that works with electric over hydraulic actuators. And those are proportional as well, so they'll, they'll kind of give you that um, smooth stopping, but this has that internal proportioning for the pressure that it puts out to the brakes. So even if your controller, um, even though the controller has that, fe that feature, to allow it to be proportional inside of here, we get that smoother activation as well. So in comparison with an electric brake setup, even when you're using a proportional brake controller, this one's still gonna be smoother and you're still gonna get better stopping power with a disc brake setup. Now, along with your actuator here, you are gonna need some additional components to convert uh, your trailer over from electric brakes to electric over hydraulic here. In addition to your actuator, you're also gonna need your rotor and caliper kits. We have those here at E-Trailer where you get your rotors and your calipers. They're typically sold as a single axle. So if you have multiple axles, you wanna make sure you purchase enough kits to install that for each of your axles. You'll also need a line kit to install, to get the fluid from the actuator here back to your disc brakes. There's a couple of different styles that are out there. We have some from Hydrostar that are your traditional uh, solid lines that you can bend yourself. But there are also flexible lines like the ones we're using here from Kodiak. You can get those from Kodiak. Kodiak also makes uh, a lot of the disc brake components that we use here at E-Trailer. And the flexible lines are a little bit easier to work with. So you don't need any special tools to bend the brake line or anything like that. So they are easier to work with. Um, they are gonna be a little bit more expensive than your traditional line, but they, they do come out a little bit nicer in the end because they're just so much easier to work with. Uh, if you're comfortable with using brake line bending tools and things like that, you can do a very good job yourself with regular brake line, but uh, if you're a little bit unsure, you haven't worked with brake line before, I would stick with the flexible ones because they're just so much easier to work with. On our power section here, we get all that stuff from the battery, but we are going to also want a circuit breaker for our unit here that doesn't have one that comes included. And the circuit breaker just ensures that when we get power sent up to our unit over here, in the event that anything happens, you get into an accident or something and one of these wires shorts out that has proper circuit protection so we don't uh, overload any wires and have any um, potential fires or any risks that could happen by unprotected shorted circuitry. We'll begin our installation here at the front of our trailer. We're underneath uh, the overhang here, and this is our front compartment. We've got it opened up. 
we need to figure out where we're going to mount the actuator. And this is usually the best place to mount it right here at the front. Uh, this way it's close to our seven poles. So we can wire it up easily as well as our batteries up here so we can get those wired up. And having it here in this compartment usually keeps it up so it's the highest point in our system which makes bleeding the brakes a little bit easier as well. So right here in our compartment, once we go inside, there's plenty of room here over on the driver's side in this compartment. And on our Trails West trailer here, it actually fit perfectly between this supporting beam and the outer wall there. We are able to put it right in between there. There was actually already a hole drilled in the location where I put the brake line down through. So that worked out really well. I did have to enlarge that hole just a little bit in order for the line to fit through. Uh, as well as to put a grommet on there. The line almost fit through perfectly with the hole, but I wanted to have some kind of protection. So we did also use a grommet there, which you can get here at E-Trailer. It is a 9 16 inner diameter uh, grommet to allow the line to pass through. To get the actuator mounted up, we simply just set the actuator roughly in place where we wanted it. Uh, you kind of use that hole as a reference since it was there, giving me a location for my line. So I just kind of sat the actuator in this location, kind of figured that would look good for our hose there. I just took a paint stick and marked the four holes. And then I just drilled out the holes for hardware. Now the hardware doesn't come included with this. You have to provide your own. You can get that at your local hardware store. Uh, we did choose to use, make sure we have washers on both the top and the bottom. Cause this metal panel here is it's plenty of thick to support this. Uh, but it is nice to have a washer on the bottom side there to make sure you got enough surface area that nothing can pull through um, under any extreme like emergency situation. So we got those tightened down and that's how we've got it mounted up here. So really easy to mount it up. It's tons of room to work on this trailer. It just sits right in there, easily mark your holes and put them in. We do have four wires that come off of this that we'll need to wire it up. And that's the output that goes to the brakes at the back. We're using flexible line kit in order to get the fluid and pressure from our system here back to our rotors and calipers at the back. So you can get that separately here at each trailer as well. And you can get the uh, disc brake kit here as well so that we can get all the parts that you need. Next, we're gonna be hooking up our wiring. Before we hook up these four wires, let's head over to the other side here in this compartment because the blue wire here, as well as the yellow wire, need to attach to circuits that are coming from our seven pole connector. The blue is the output from your brake controller and the yellow is for our breakaway switch. And in most typical braking systems on your trailer, the electric ones, you don't normally have a separate circuit for your breakaway switch. Usually the breakaway switch just ties it right in to the uh, brake controller wire. Because on those systems, it just kind of puts it at full and it, and it applies it. The yellow wire here lets the actuator know that a breakaway event is, has occurred and then the actuator can make the appropriate decisions on how to apply those brakes for that situation. So it's a little bit different, um, but it's just simply moving the breakaway switch to a different wire. But that does require us to run an additional wire in most cases uh, in order to get this hooked up. So we're just gonna head right over to the other side of this compartment. So we're here on the opposite side. This is the passenger side. Our batteries are right here. We've got this pillar that runs out. At the top of this pillar, there's this square that's cut out. And this is actually our wiring from the seven-way connector at the front of the trailer. It runs down uh, this uh, frame piece right here on the inside of it. This duplex wire here is the wire that I used to get that extra wire for our uh, breakaway switch routed. This will go down over towards the unit and that goes up towards our seven-way. The way that I was able to get this routed through here and up to the seven-way, uh, once you pull this out of here, you'll see this blue wire right here. Uh, I've got it taped up in here, right there, the, the rest of it. The blue wire goes from your seven way, it comes back here, and then it goes down this pillar to, the, to your electric brakes at the back. So we pulled the blue wire out just a couple of inches, and we actually cut the blue wire. The part that goes down, that'll go to the brakes on the trailer, we're not gonna need that anymore. So I just taped that up in here. It's still here if uh, anybody ever needs to access it again, but they really shouldn't ever need to. The blue wire then that was heading towards the front there, we actually took that, that stuck out maybe about this far and I just wrapped some electrical tape around it and I taped my duplex wire to it here. You can get duplex wire here at E-Trailer. There's two wires inside of this sheathing. After we taped this duplex to the blue wire, we went to the other end where our seven ways located down here at the opposite end. I went ahead and removed the cover. There's just two screws and I found the blue wire inside of here. 
After finding the blue wire in here, I cut the blue wire here, separating it from the wire coming from the seven way. So that way I've got just a piece of wire that's here that's running back there that's taped to our new wire on the other end. I simply just pulled this wire then until our wires pulled through. And that's what you can see here. The duplex wire is right here. Inside the duplex, you have a white and a black wire. I connected the black one back to the blue and that's gonna be our new break output wire is the black wire that I'd run inside the duplex and then the white wire in the duplex I hooked to the breakaway switch. So we've separated those two now so that way we've got the two separate circuits we need to hook to our actuator. So we've got our brake signal wire and our breakaway switch wire routed from here all the way over to the actuator. We need two more circuits. There's that black and white wire on our actuator. That's our power and our ground circuit. We're gonna get those right here. Our batteries are here. We're using duplex wire once again. So we're using another length of this to go from our batteries over to that side. This is a completely separate duplex wire from the one that we routed up through the pillar there. On this duplex wire, we take the black wire and we route it up. We kind of go behind the battery and there's actually already a fuse or a yeah, uh, circuit breaker located here. We added another circuit breaker right here. This does not come included with your actuator. It's a 40 amp circuit breaker. You can get it here at each trailer. We connected that black wire from our duplex right here to the silver post on the circuit breaker. The copper post on our circuit breaker needs to connect to our battery source. So we come off of there and we actually just go right up over here to the other side of this circuit breaker here. And we just attach it to the post there. The reason why we attach it to this post and not directly to the battery positive, if we follow this wire down from here, this goes directly to the battery positive down here. And you see all these things that he's got stacked up on here. There's really no threads left on this battery to keep adding more ring terminals. So we can attach it up here and be perfectly fine because we've got this big thick wire here that's connected to our positive that'll send plenty of current to the entirety of our trailer and also for our braking system. That'll all work out just fine. The white wire from our duplex down here needs to connect to ground. So we simply just kind of looped that around and attached to this ground stud right here. Again, you could also go to the battery, but they're running pretty low on threads here as well. And this big, thick black wire that's coming off the negative post actually just runs right over here to this stud. So we've got a nice solid ground connection there as well. So here we're back over at our actuator so we can make all the connections over here. I did want to point out the black wire though off of our actuator. I did already have that connected to the black wire off the duplex that's going to the circuit breaker over there. I hooked it up here at the actuator before I hooked the circuit breaker up to the battery because if you hook to the battery first, that means the end of this wire over here is live and we didn't want to accidentally cause any shorts over here on this side. So if you hook it to the actuator first on here, you know that you've got this wire sealed up where it's not going to cause any accidental shorts. But we still got three more wires that we got to hook up here. We've got all the wires that we need routed over to this point now. So we just need to make those last few connections here. So these are the ones coming from our actuator. The black goes to black, which goes to that power source from the circuit breaker. We'll go ahead and hook up our ground next, which is the white wire here. So just take that wire. We're going to take a butt connector here. And we are using heat shrink butt connectors. I know this is a compartment, so normally I wouldn't use heat shrink in a compartment because it's protected from the elements. But this one's not very well sealed. If you kind of look around, there's plenty of openings, especially way down here is a big opening. So there's a chance for dew and other humidities to get in here and potentially uh, cause corrosion on these circuits. So we're gonna use heat shrink butt connectors to ensure that that's not gonna occur. We're just gonna crimp that down. And then we'll take the white wire here. This is the one that's connected to ground. I've labeled the other circuits since they were duplex, they're going to look just like it. So I labeled with some blue painters tape on this black wire here, letting me know that I hooked that to the blue wire coming from the brake controller. And then I put a little bit of yellow uh, from, our, from a paint stick on this one to let me know this is the one that is hooked to the breakaway switch and that will hook to the yellow wire down here. So it's a good idea to label those circuits if you're using wires of similar color. We'll now strip back our white one here because we know this one's hooked to ground. We've already got our ground butt connector there, so we'll simply take the other end. Can sometimes help make it slide into the connector easier if you give a little twist there. Push the two components together, two wires. 
and then we'll just crimp these down. All right, now that we've got those that connection made there, we're just gonna move on it. Can, can you connect in the rest of them? Next is blue. And we know that the blue wire on the actuator connects to the output from our brake controller, which is normally a blue wire, but in our case, it's gonna be black with the blue tape on it because we had replaced it. And lastly, our yellow wire, which is our breakaway switch connection. We'll put one on here as well. There we go. We've got all of our connections made. So just to reiterate, that's yellow wire from the actuator goes to breakaway switch. Blue wire from the actuator goes to output from your brake controller that comes from your seven-way connector. Black from the actuator goes to battery positive on your trailer and you want to make sure you have circuit protection in line. That's that 40 amp circuit breaker we used. Ground. Here is our white wire from our actuator. It needs to hook to ground on our trailer which we use this white wire here to run over to that ground by our batteries. So now we'll take our heat gun here and just shrink down these butt connectors. If you need a heat gun, you can get one here at E-Trailer. We're using the small one from Performance Tools, but we do also have larger, larger ones. They'll work a little faster than these smaller ones, uh, but these smaller ones work pretty well for just doing butt connectors in these smaller areas like this. There is a wireless version also available uh, that I would not recommend if you do a lot of repairs, but if it's just for an occasional repair, it's small and convenient for those applications, but if you got a bunch of butt connectors and stuff to do, you're gonna hate yourself using that one. But if you just got a handful, it'll work out great. All right, so now we have our actuator fully hooked up. Now, I do not recommend testing it, though, at this point, because you don't wanna operate your pump here when it's dry, we don't have any fluid in it. And if you've just installed the pump here, you don't have any lines or anything like that installed. So your next step would be to install your line kit. And if you haven't already done so, install your disc brakes and rotors. Uh, Cause we need to have all those together. And then we can get this full of fluid. We can get the system bled and verify everything's working there, but we do need to get the fluid in there. So at this point, if you haven't done so already, get those components installed and then we'll show you how to get this bled. So we're gonna open up our fill cap. We don't want this on while we're bleeding. Uh, the suction could actually pull the seal out of here and it could potentially damage it. So just set that over there for now. Uh, this lets you know what kind of fluid you're going to want to use. We've got some dot three fluid we're going to be using today. And I always take a little rag and put it around there. If you need a funnel, you can use a funnel, but this is a pretty uh, easy location here to access. So we shouldn't probably have too much of an issue with this but I always take a little napkin and just put it around there in case I do accidentally spill any we can sop it up there and try not to make too much mess so now we're just going to fill it up and just as you're filling it just check periodically because it doesn't hold that much fluid in the actual reservoir and it takes it a second for it to kind of get down through the system there so don't don't pour it in too fast Just kind of pouring a little and checking, pouring a little and checking. There we go, it's all the way full. So now that we've got this full, we're just gonna clean up this little bit of mess here and then we'll head back to our brakes. So we're now here at the passenger side furthest rear brake caliper. This is our farthest location from where we mounted our actuator. That's where you wanna start. So if you mounted your actuator on the passenger side, if you weren't following with us and doing it over there, you would want to start on the driver's side at the rear. But since we have ours mounted on the driver's side at the front, we're at the passenger side rear here. And we're going to first, before we uh, bleed the brakes, we're going to let gravity do a lot of the work for us. Uh, because you can just open these up, get the system full, and if you just let it sit, it's about lunchtime here. So we're going to get this set up, go to lunch, and let's see if gravity is going to take care of most of the work for us. We've got a 5 16 wrench here that we're going to use to open up the bleeder. You do have two bleeders per caliper. You have a top and a bottom. The reason why you have a top and a bottom is because depending on your trailer and the axle ratings and stuff, it changes the location of where the caliper locates 
as far as the orientation, whether it's here on top. Uh, so you get two, you always wanna use the top one. The bottom one is just there if the copper was mounted in a different orientation. So that's our, our guy right there. I've gone ahead and prepared kind of a little setup here. It's just a, it's just a drink bottle, the hole in it, and a clear hose that runs down into it. You could just use a clear hose and run it down into a pan. That also works pretty nicely. Um, but you want something to help minimize the mess that you're gonna have, because uh, brake fluid is pretty corrosive. It destroys paint really fast and feel, dries out your hands. It's just, it's just some, uh, some powerful, potent stuff. So we're poking our hose on here, getting it poked right onto the nipple, kind of getting our container here to set so it'll stay where it needs to be. And what we're gonna do next is just crack this loose with our 5 16 wrench here. Get a couple of turns on it. And now that's opened up. At this point now, we're just gonna let gravity Take the weight of our fluid that's in the highest location above our frame here in our compartment, push down through the system to push that air out. So we're just going to let it sit here like this now, probably go to lunch, come back and see where we're at. Sometimes you get lucky and the majority of the fluid uh, makes its way down through the system and you get the air out of it. And we can actually see if we look at it here, there's an occasional bubble that will occur in there. So it is starting to make its way through the system. Um, but normally you are still going to have to bleed more after this, but just letting it sit here and doing the gravity like this, it really helps get a lot of the air pushed out as the fluid takes its place. So that way when we do go to bleed it here uh, after this to get any of the minute amounts of air that's left in there out, uh, just really speeds up the amount of time that you're physically having to work. I mean, you could go right into bleeding now if you wanted to. It's going to take a little bit more bleeding process than if you let it gravity bleed, but it can go faster. You know, we're not going to let this sit. You want it to let it sit for, uh, for a while if you're not going to gravity bleed it. But I uh, always like to minimize labor because you could let this sit and go do something else. You know, go play with your grandkids or here at the shop I can go work on another car. So we let it sit for about 30 minutes while we went to lunch and we did get actually quite a bit of fluid here that's made its way out. I checked the reservoir and it was a little bit low so I topped it up. We're now ready to actually bleed the brakes to get the, all the air fully out of it, because this is just kind of to help us get some fluid into the system, kind of get a majority of the air pushed out. Definitely saves you some time there on how, often, how much you're gonna have to bleed this manually. But now we're gonna bleed it manually to get the rest of that air that's trapped in there pushed all the way out. So we've got an assistant up front who's gonna activate it. There's a couple of ways you could have your assistant activate it. They could either pull the breakaway switch pin to turn the system on, or if you've got it hooked up to like a truck, you could use your brake controller and the manual slide to activate it. We're using a test box that simulates the manual slide from a brake controller for ours. So I've closed this off and we'll have our assistant up there activate it and we can open this up. Our assistant's also gonna be watching the fluid level inside of the reservoir because we never wanna let that reservoir go empty because if it does, while we're bleeding the brakes, we have to start completely over because you've got air in the system then, so it, it, you have to restart the whole process. So it's important to just do a little bit of bleeding at a time, double check that reservoir and make sure it stays full. So here we're at the front, just as you can see, here's your breakaway switch pin if you wanted to pull this. Uh, our assistant though is gonna be using this test box here that simulates the manual slide from a brake controller. And what we're gonna do is open this bleeder, we'll have our assistant activate the system and then we'll close it off. So go ahead and open, uh, activate. The system's running. We can hear it running. We've got some fluid pumping, so we're going to go ahead and stop it and close it. And then we're going to have our assistant double check the reservoir just to make sure that it, uh, it didn't go empty because that first time you activate it, you're pushing that fluid into a lot of empty spots that the gravity hadn't taken care of yet. So you can lose a lot of fluid in the reservoir really fast. All right, our assistant has topped it up. We're just going to repeat this process until we get a solid stream coming out of our hose. That's why we like to use a transparent hose like this that you can see in. So I'm going to open it up and then you can go ahead and activate. Keep on going. Oh, okay. So yeah, our assistant was watching and as soon as he activated it there, it drew the fluid down the reservoir and he stopped it. And that's exactly what you want your assistant to do is keep an eye on that reservoir to make sure it doesn't go empty. So he's going to top it back up and we're just going to keep repeating this process until it's completely solid. We don't want to see any spurts. If you see like bubbles coming out of there, and you're looking for those bubbles while you hear the pump running. If after the pump shuts off, you see a couple of bubbles, 
that's probably air like back feeding up through the hose from your bottle and stuff like that. It's not coming from the system. And our assistant's activating it some more and we've got a pretty solid stream coming out of here. So we're gonna close this one off and we're gonna move to the next break and we're gonna check and see there and then just go from break to break until we get this nice solid uh, line of fluid coming out of here. Uh, if you didn't do the gravity bleed, you would likely see a lot of spurts and bubbles in there, but the gravity bleed um, helps get that fluid down here. So the air is usually only in the first couple of times you run it. And then after that, you usually get it pretty solid if you've gravity bled most of it out. So we're just going to move on to the next one and rinse and repeat these same procedures on there, making sure that you know, you've tightened this one up before moving on. So we move down to the next one and we've opened it up. Go ahead and activate. And we can see bubbles there. Yep. And there we go. We've got some solid fluid coming out of there now. We're going to shut it off. Our assistant will double check. And if the reservoir is full, we'll just keep on going until it's, it's solid. But you were able to see some of that air bubbles there. All right, we're going to open it back up again. Good. Our assistant's activating. A little bit more air in it there, but we're looking pretty solid now. So we're going to go ahead and close this off. That was nice and solid. Move to the next break. And then, again, we're just rinsing and repeating until we get that solid all the way around. So now that we've got all the air bled from the brake system, nice and solid coming out of each caliper there. We double checked the reservoir and made sure that that's topped up. At this point now, we need to verify that our breakaway switch is working properly. So when we pull this, it should activate it. And this is gonna put our system kind of at like a full, full blast to make sure our motorhome stops. We want that full pressure on our system too, so we can look down and check all of our lines and especially at any connection point uh, on our lines to make sure we don't have any leaks. So we're going to pull this pin and then we're going to verify that it activates. If it does activate, we're going to head under the trailer and then check all those lines for any signs of leaks. Activated. Go see if we got leaks. So upon our leak inspection, you can see on the ground down here and a couple of drops below, we did have some leakage back here. So we talked about how these are ridiculously high uh, pressure going through this. So it was leaking from this fitting here. All we're gonna do is come back here and just put a little bit more oomph on this. <clears throat> we're able to get a little bit more out of it. And then we're gonna recheck for leaks after we get this tightened down. Make sure that, yeah, we were able to get quite a bit out of this one. And it's important you have your line wrench tool there to make sure that you can get this kind of <clears throat> force on it. So now we've got that nice and snug verified it here we're going to do the same thing we're going to uh, we are going to have to re-bleed run through those procedures again because we had quite a bit that uh, leaked out here if you find the leak in time to where it hasn't run the reservoir completely drained uh, then you don't need to re-bleed but um, on ours we didn't catch it in time the reservoir drained out so we have to restart our bleed procedure so we're going to get this re-bled and then we're going to recheck for leaks we have now re-bled we pulled the pin and we're going to double check for any leaks here. And we are looking good this time. That leak is no longer present. We're going to double check each of our connection points at all spots and make sure there's no signs because we're looking for not just that that was a pretty big leak we had, but just for the sign of even a drip or a drop. We're going to look for anything like that. Now that we've got all the air bled out of our system, the brakes are fully bled. We verify there's no leaks. We want to come back to the brakes. Just make sure that none of these have locked up on us. So check to make sure each one spins. And then we also want to make sure that they are working. So we have our assistant go ahead and activate the brakes. And I can't spin it now. You can go ahead and deactivate the brakes. And when he deactivates them, there we go. We can spin it once again. So we know that uh, our brakes appear to be working properly. We're going to go ahead and put everything back together at this point. So we've gone ahead and brought it outside. We hooked it up to our toter truck here so we can test it out and make sure it's working. Getting ready to pull it into a parking spot. We're going to go ahead and activate the brakes and we can see that it stops our truck and it actually prevents our toter truck from being able to pull this when we activate them. So we've got plenty of braking power at our brakes here. And that completes our installation of Hydrostar 1600 PSI disc brake actuator on our 2022 Trails West by RPM.